Welcome. I wanted to thank you guys for joining me today for this webcast entitled Improving Venous Leg Ulcer and Lymphedema Outcomes, a focus on two-layer compression systems. My name is Susie Eman, and I'll be your host today. My disclosures are listed here. And some information about this program. It's provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education and supported by an educational grant from 3M Medical Solutions Division. Let's jump right in. Our learning objectives are listed here. We're gonna identify the pathophysiology of venous disease and phlebolymphedema. We're gonna explore the clinical decision-making that occurs prior to implementing compression to manage edema across the spectrum. And we're also gonna examine the science and the clinical applications of two-layer compression therapy utilizing different case studies. But before we can dive into the topic of compression, we really have to first address the antiquated view of lymphedema. In mainstream medicine, in your clinics, I bet if I ask each of you, when you think about lymphedema, this is what you think of. The big leg, misshapen, perhaps there's lobules, perhaps there's wounds. Or perhaps this is the vision that most people have of lymphedema, which is cancer-related lymphedema. So you have here a leg that uh, leg presentation of lymphedema that has resulted from melanoma treatment. And then the other two, of course, are breast cancer. So without a doubt, everybody agrees that that is lymphedema. However, modern evidence has highlighted the key role that a functioning lymphatic system plays with regards to tissue fluid balance and integumentary health. We now know that there's no resorption of interstitial fluid back into the venous end of the blood capillaries and that all fluid and proteins actually return back to the vascular space via the lymphatics. The lymphatics are really important. And if the lymphatics are impaired, you're gonna have a loss or an impact on the integument which means that the patients that have chronic venous insufficiency, perhaps they've had a surgery, that's lymphedema. You have your chronic cellulitis. You have your chronic non-healing wounds. You have primary lymphedema. You have a condition called lipedema or lipolymphedema. All of these are involved because of an impaired lymphatic system. This is all lymphedema, which brings us to that age old argument of, is it edema or lymphedema? I wanna explain that to you. So an edema is actually a symptom. It's not a diagnosis. It's a buildup of fluid in the tissues or the interstitium. Lymphedema is a diagnosis. It's chronic edema that results from an impairment or a malformation or dysfunction of the lymphatic system and it's associated with a chronic inflammatory state. All edemas indicate that there's an inadequacy or failure of lymphatic drainage. So as you can see, you're gonna to have to take a second look at those patients when they come into your clinic if you're saying that it's just edema. Remember, edema is a symptom. Lymphedema is the diagnosis. So let's look a little bit further at the new definition for lymphedema. So I call it lymphedema 2021. By definition, it is a chronic localized swelling of the body that's caused by an abnormal accumulation of lymphatic fluid. The, it's caused because there just is a disruption in the normal flow of lymph. And as a result, you get a buildup of the fluid and the protein in the tissue. If you leave this untreated, it causes chronic inflammation and reactive fibrosis. So all those patients that you're seeing in your wound care clinic or perhaps in your medical office, and they have that hard, woody, fibrotic tissue, that's lymphedema. And in addition to those trophic changes that you're seeing, there's an impaired immune response, which means that those patients are at an increased risk for cellulitis. They have a delayed wound healing response because the lymphatics are impaired. And again, there's recurrent infections or ulcerations. So it's really important that we identify lymphedema when it's there or when it's present. So again, all of these pictures that you see, you have again the melanoma patient, you have your breast cancer patient, but in addition, these are all uh, lymphatic impairment 
patients. All of these patients have lymphedema in addition to their chronic non-healing wounds. So when you think about it, it's really the thought, the better way to think about lymphedema is about a continuum, right? So it doesn't matter the origin. You can certainly say that this is post-surgical edema, that the edema resulted because of the orthopedic elective surgery. But the fact that you have this much edema is a sign that the lymphatics are overwhelmed. And as such, you should treat that. You, of course, you guys are familiar with venous edema and you have dependent edema. But again, each of these is a sign that the lymphatic system is impaired. And as such, we should be treating that. And so how do we treat lymphedema? The treatment for lymphedema, the gold standard is something that we'll call CDT or complete decongestive therapy. It has four parts, skin and wound care, manual lymphatic drainage, which is a massage that you can do to help stimulate the lymphatics, compression. And this is what I spend a lot of time doing. As a lymphedema therapist, I spend many hours of my day doing compression wrapping of different kinds. In addition to compression wraps, we can also use compression pumps. So your intermittent pneumatic compression pumps, or you can use compression garments. The fourth component of CDT is exercise. It's really important that we get our patients up and moving because we know that activity, even if it's passive, can stimulate the lymphatics when the limb is compressed. And then there's a fifth one that I like to add in, and that's education. It's super important that we're educating our patients about lymphedema, about lymphatic impairment, and what they can do to help manage their condition at home. Let's look a little bit closer. So why are we using compression to manage lymphedema? Well, first you have to understand compression just a little bit better. Remember that compression is defined as the application of a bandage or compression garment or device, and that creates pressure on the anything that's enclosed within that application. That pressure is transmitted to the tissues and all the internal structures, right? So let's take a little bit closer look. That means that when you apply compression to a limb, you're impacting the vascular system, the venous system, the lymphatic system, and the arterial system. So I think you guys all know about how compression improves the lymphatic or the venous system. So when you apply compression to a limb, it enhances venous return, which is going to decrease the venous hypertension, which is going to decrease the amount of fluids that are filtrating out into the tissues, right? And then we also know that when you apply compression, it enhances the calf muscle pump when your patient walks. We also know that compression enhances the lymphatic system in a very similar way. When you apply compression to a limb, that compression increases the movement or the lymph motoricity of the lymphatic system. It actually makes the lymph vessel pump faster. You will increase the resorption of the fluid from the tissues back into the vessels. So again, it's a plus to both the venous and the lymphatic system. And then we can't forget that there is evidence to show that appropriately applied compression enhances arterial flow. By decongesting the interstitial tissue space, you can actually enhance arterial flow. So it's important that we think about compression. It's not about only limiting our compression applications to those with venous issues, but we can also appropriately apply compression for any of these patients. And we're gonna have some case studies for you to see. But I wanna kind of give you just a little bit more information about compression because compression is really exciting. Compression is more than edema reduction. Far too often when we think about compression, when we're applying it to the limb, we're only thinking about putting it on patients who our limbs are really swollen. But realize that you can use compression to enhance those trophic changes. So again, you've got a picture here of a patient that has that really thick skin. You can see after we wrap it for a week, the volume reduces, but those skin changes are still there. But notice if we continue with compression at eight weeks, all of those trophic changes have resolved. Why is that? That's because you're addressing the underlying cause of those trophic changes. 
compression addresses the inflammatory response in the tissue that is caused by that lymphatic impairment. If you fix the problem, the symptom goes away. And then what's really exciting with a new line of research, we're actually seeing that you may have a similar effect on the wound bed itself. And this is full disclosure, this is some work that I'm doing. And what we did is we looked at the way that, what compression looks like on the skin. So you can see here in this box insert, you have uh, different compression applications. You have two layer products, you have a four layer wrap, and then you have a lymphedema wrap. And what's important to notice just from this slide is the way that the pressure is distributed across the tissue itself. And so what you notice is in the uh, traditional applications, you'll see that that pressure is kind of evenly distributed across the tissue itself. You don't really see a, a definitive pattern. But yet when I add a textured product underneath, and this is a longitudinal elastic product, um, you can see that when I put it underneath the bandage, the way that the pressure is distributed changes. It actually is mir a mirror image of what the product looks like. And then what's really exciting is that you can look and the wound will actually heal in a mirrored fashion. So here you can see in this picture, you get linear re-epithelialization that matches that distribution. As well as I hope you can see in that bottom picture, this is what the wound looked like before we got started. It has very sharp edges. But when we add the textured product, you actually get more of a scalloped pattern that again, corresponds with the pattern of the textured product that I'm applying to the tissue. So what we're doing here is we're mechanically deforming the tissue and getting improvements in those tissue texture changes. So keep in mind, compression isn't just about edema reduction. It's not just about enhanced venous return. It's about healing those integument system, most of which you're working on that lymphatic system. So how does that happen? How does compression work? You need to keep in, keep in mind two things. First, there is pressure. And I think everybody understands that. If you apply a compression application to the limb, it creates a pressure because you've stretched that product across the tissue. So that's the force that's created by the elastic recoil of that bandage. And that's what we think of as the resting pressure. This is what the patient feels when you put a compression product on. So in this graph here, it would be represented by what I've colored in green. It's that pressure that's just of the bandage resting on the tissue. And that's part of the way that compression works, right? Just how much it squeezes the limb. But perhaps the better way that compression works is because of stiffness, meaning that the force that's created by the resistance of that product trying to be stretched. So it's a really a measure of fabric flexibility. And stiffness is going to impact the working pressures. So again, I'll refer you to the graph at the bottom here. You can see that when we first apply a bandage, you have a resting pressure. When the patient moves, whether they just stand up, they pump their ankles, they wiggle around, that pressure changes because of the stiffness. What's important to note from this graph is that dependent on the materials that you use, you're gonna get a different level. So if you have a product that's highly elastic, for instance, like a common uh, long stretch bandage, like an ACE wrap perhaps, you're gonna see that you don't get as great of an amplitude change when you have that elastic product compared to a product that is stiff like a short stretch bandage or a short stretch application, you'll see that the amplitude of change is much greater with that stiffer product. So what you're really doing when you're trying to get compression to work for you is you're creating a rigid container inside of which that, that, that muscle pump is working for you. And remember, it's the stiffness of the fine old bandage that determines the performance rather than the individual components. So keep that in mind, because we're gonna talk about different compression applications that are available, that different textiles will create different dynamic pr pressure profiles, okay? So let's keep going. So when you think about compress therapeutic compression, you cannot just think about resting pressure. 
you have to think about resting and working pressure. But then there's something else that you need to consider, and that's containment. And so what I mean by this is that, again, we're trying to create a uniform rigid sleeve around the tissue, which allows for even pressure distribution. Now, a lot of people, when they think about compression, they think about gradient compression. But really, when we talk about developing a rigid sleeve, we're using a different physics principle, and that's Pascal's law, which basically says that if you apply pressure to fluid that is enclosed with a within a container, that that pressure is evenly distributed throughout the container. And so it's important that you're keeping the forces produced inside of that cylinder. Now, let's take that and, and apply it to compression. So I've got a funny diagram for you at the bottom. It's one of those squeezy stress balls, but I want you to appreciate because the netting that's around the material doesn't offer good containment, you can see how the tissue bulges out when the pressure is expanded, right? So uneven distribution of pressure can create trauma. Let's see what that looks like in the clinic. So these are all patients that have come into my clinic situations where there was an inappropriate textile choice. You have non-therapeutic pressures and pressure distribution. So again, this is a elastic stockinette that uh, simply had rolled down and binded, but you can see what even a very light compressive product, if it's not evenly distributed across the limb, you can create trauma. And again, you can see that here with just a single ACE bandage that tends to gather in uh, areas and you're actually gonna get trauma because of those uneven distribution of pressure. So I'd rather you guys think about therapeutic compression, not so much about how tight it is, but about how that pressure is distributed across the limb. So I've come up with an acronym for you, RAP, and that stands for working pressure and resting pressure in a therapeutic range. R stands for reliable application. We have to make sure that the products that we're using can be consistently applied by you or your colleague in the same manner. It needs to have minimal slippage and it needs to offer good containment. A stands for adaptability, which means that we need to be able to adapt compression products to our patient. You've heard the old analogy of you can't fit a square peg into a round hole. Similarly, you can't expect to take a box off a shelf and expect it to match every single patient that walks into your clinic. These products need to be adaptable to the patient. And then finally, P stands for people friendly. And this is probably the most important because you guys know if the compression product isn't comfortable on the patient, they're not going to wear it. So it's important that it be comfortable to the patient, but that it's also cost effective, meaning that we want a product that, again, that's gonna stay in, pay, in place that you're not gonna to have to constantly be changing because that's wasteful, wasting your time and money. Let's keep going. Now, let's look at the compression banding, bandage options that are currently available on the market. They're really divided into two categories. We have what I like to call package companded packaged compression bandage kits, so the boxed sets. And then there are custom compression bandages. I typically reserve these for more of my complex lymphedema patients, and I'm gonna show you a picture of that. But let's look a little bit closer at each of these. So when we think about the box sets, there are a lot of varieties that are out there. There are two layer, three layer, four layer options. They are single patient use, they're disposable, they're user friendly. The manufacturers have done a great job of doing testing to ensure that these products provide therapeutic pressures, right? And that they have provided for you a, a simple application technique. The composition of these bandage products though vary. So again, keep in mind to that statement that I made earlier, that different textiles will create different compression pressures. So it's important that you remember that an, each system is different. You can't replace one with the other. 
That might also mean that if one product is not working for you, don't just throw compression out the window, try a different compression product. So, and that's also important to remember when you're reviewing the literature, and we're gonna be looking a little bit at the literature that's out there, it's important that you know what compression product that the study was done with, because you really cannot uh, assume that if a product was done with one two layer, I'm sorry, if the study was done with one two layer product, that you're going to get the exact same role results with another two layer product. They're all different. A quick mention about the custom compression bandages that you may see your lymphedema therapists use. They typically are composed of uh, different materials. In fact, they're reusable. Um, there is some instruction that's required for the application of these bandages. It doesn't mean that you can't learn as a wound declare clinician to put on a lymphedema bandage. It just means that needs to be a little bit of training that needs to happen. There's really no clinical information though on the therapeutic compression profile of the compression, uh, the custom compression bandages. And that's important when we're looking at which patients to put those applications on. And also remember that with your custom compression uh, lymphedema bandages that we're applying, and I'm gonna show you a picture that we're picking those uh, individual pieces to match the patient presentation. So there's a lot of individualization that goes on with a lymphedema multilayer bandage. So let me show you real quick what that looks like. Again, the slide is overwhelming, but again, I wanted to break it down for you. Um, with lymphedema patients, we'll use uh, open cell. Uh, this is called half inch gray foam. We'll cut it to match whatever shapes we need. We may use some textured products underneath the bandage in order to help promote, again, breaking down that fibrotic tissue. We're gonna layer this in, and then we're gonna put on multiple layers of short stretch bandages. So you can see here in this picture, I've got four short stretch bandages of varying width. I started out with two eight centimeters and then a 10 centimeter and then a 12 centimeter short stretch. And then I'm gonna continue my bandage all the way to the thigh and I'm using some rolled foam here, as well as an additional three 12 inch bandages. So if you wanna compare this to perhaps a two layer bandage, this one you can see I actually have seven different compression bandages in place. So a completely different animal. And that's a whole other lecture that we'll do at a different time. Let's get back to the compression box sets. So the com package compression bandage kits that you're gonna see in your clinic Again, come in those two, three, or four layer options. They're all different. And this is where I encourage you to reach out to your compression manufacturers and find out a little bit more about the specifics for the compression products that you're using. Realize that just because it says two layers, it could be two short stretch bandages. It could be a, a short stretch and a cohesive. It could be a short stretch and a long stretch. You know, it could be a medicated layer. So again, it's really important that you understand what you're using in order to get optimal resort, results. Majority of these manufacturers have it stated that if appropriately applied, you're gonna get your therapeutic pressure range, as well as there are new so-called light products that are available that will you'll be able to use for those patients who have a decreased um, ankle brachial index. So again, there's a lot of varieties that are out there. It's, it's important that you know what you're applying to your patients because different textiles create different dynamic pressure profiles. So let's look at what the literature tells us about compression and in particular about two layer products. You guys have heard all of this before. You know, the biggest thing that we can pull out of the literature is that in a some compression is better than none, right? And that we know that inelastic compression or compression that provides that stiffness, which is gonna give us a lower resting, but a higher working pressure is more beneficial. We also know that multi-layer is more effective than a single layer of compression. And that what we're shooting for with our compression applications is a working pressure that's greater than 50. Again, we're looking for stiff, not tight. 
If we look specifically at the literature pertaining to two-layer cohesive products or two-layer bandage sets, we have found there's literature to say that two-layer is optimal to even the four-layer products. So in particular, there was a study that was looking at a variety of two-layer products and four-layer, and it found that Coban 2 achieved better ulcer healing than the other two-layer systems that were assessed and better than four-layer and that the patients in the study um, demonstrated better health-related quality of life improvements with the two-layer products, that there was a lower cost that was associated with the Coban 2 products compared to the others, as well as there were no adverse events um, between the groups. So again, there's studies to show that a two-layer product is beneficial, cost-effective, and well-tolerated by our patients. In particular, there's research to show that Coban 2 is superior to the other two layer products that are available in the study that was performed. So what does that mean to you? So again, research has shown that higher compression pressures with a minimum of 40 to 60 millimeters of mercury is what we're looking for for resting pressure is beneficial. And you also need to keep in mind that you need to make sure that pressure is evenly distributed over your ulcer area as well. But realize that too high of a pressure can cause local skin trauma. And that's what this looks like. So again, you can see in the picture, they had applied two elastic bandages and it creates a very high resting pressure. And you can see the trauma that has occurred across the anterior tibialis tendon. A better, more therapeutic Application, again, we're looking for that sweet spot, low resting, high working, can be achieved with Coban 2. And you can see that pictured here where you have much better even containment and the results speak for themselves. So what we're reaching for, the star that we're reaching for when we're talking about therapeutic compression is low resting, high working. And that two layer wraps offer this therapeutic pressure and containment while at the same time minimizing bulk, which means that the patients are able to wear their shoes, they're able to get their pants on and off, they're able to resume their activities of normal living, which is super important when it comes to compliance with a compression regimen. Let's get back to what we talked about before as kind of a mnemonic for how you can achieve therapeutic compression. It's a wrap. So W again stood for working pressure. You need to make sure that the compression product that you're choosing achieves a therapeutic working pressure, right? And the literature recommends 40 to 60 millimeters of mercury of, of pressure in order to positively impact the hemodynamics. So whether or not your patient is a mover and a shaker or perhaps someone that's not moving quite as fast or sedentary, realize that if you apply a stiff product with even containment, you're gonna get a good working pressure. Two layer wraps offer therapeutic pressures and containment while minimizing the bulk, allowing your patient to continue with their activities of daily living. R stands for reliability. Again, I mentioned it's really important that the application be something that you can apply correctly, but so can your friend or your colleague. You need to have consistency with the way that the applications are applied to your patients in order to have good outcomes. Studies have shown that the application of Coban 2 with a simple two-step process where you have an inner polyurethane latex-free layer next to the patient combined with the outer cohesive non-woven layer creates that rigid container. And one thing that's really unique about Coban 2, it's the fact that those two layers are actually cohesive together, together that gives you that better containment. And it's that stiff containment that's afforded by that a unique combination that allows Coban 2 to have reliable application as well as containment for the patient. And what that means for your patient is that the bandage is going to stay up longer. And we call that staying power. And there have been studies that have shown that Coban 2 was shown to have less slippage at 24 and 48 hours, which is pictured here in the graph of the different compression products that are available, demonstrating again that Coban 2 had less slippage compared to the rest. 
A stands for adaptability. And I think probably this is one of the most important things to keep in mind. It's important to realize that we need to adapt what we're doing uh, for our patients to our patients, meaning that alter your compression application to match your patient's presentation, but also your patient's need. So again, you've got a patient here. Clearly they have venous insufficiency, but look at where the wound is. We need to have a way that you can adapt the application to the patient's uh, presentation. So I can show you what I did here. I did some toe wraps. I used the Coban 2. I cut the comfort layer so that I had compression across the amputation site. And as a result, was able to heal that wound. Another thing that you can do with Coban 2 is that because of the sufficient containment that's afforded by those cohesive layers, it means that you can apply compression to a full leg. So you saw this gentleman earlier here, and you can see that they've tried to achieve compression below the knee with an elastic product. It's not working. Not to mention, look at the fullness above in the upper thigh. We took Coban 2 and applied it from the toes to the knee, the knee to the thigh, and we got a significantly better result because of the containment that is afforded by that unique cohesive uh, uh, cohesive component between the two different layers. And then finally realize that there are applications for Coban 2 for genital edema. I've used it to wrap a chest wall. I've used it to wrap arms, as well as you can use Coban 2 to wrap the genitals to address scrotal edema. I encourage you to reach out to your 3M representative and have some additional instruction and training on those unique applications. But let's keep going because we've got to get to P. With the adaptability, we also need to keep in mind those patients who have peripheral arterial disease and can't tolerate those higher level of pressures. Coban 2 has a light version that allows for those who have an ABI less greater than 0.5. So just because someone has peripheral arterial disease doesn't mean that they can't have compression. It just means you mean you need to pick the right product. And there's studies that have been shown with Coban light that it was safe and well tolerated by those patients, even with an ABI of 0.5 to 0.8, and that the average sub-bandaged pressure was less than 28 millimeters of mercury. So you're getting your therapeutic compression even in those patients with a uh, underlying arterial insufficiency. So don't limit your patients the benefit of compression, just pick a different compression product. The last thing that we need to talk about is P, which is people friendly. Again, comfort. It's so important that the compression applications that we're applying to our patients, that they're comfortable. We're asking them to stay in that wrap for three, five, or seven days. It needs to be comfortable to them. They need to be able to get their shoes on, their pants on. They need to be able to walk and carry out their lives. There have been studies that have been done looking at Coban 2 compared to four layer wraps. And what was found was that Coban 2 came out to be superior to the four layer wrap with regards to slippage, health related quality of life, patient preference and wound healing. It was also found that Coban 2 was cost effective, which is again, people friendly, people meaning you and your patient. But let's look at Coban 2 and RAP in action. So I've listed out here for you, again, that acronym to keep in mind what we're trying to do with compression is we're trying to ensure that we have good working pressure, that the application is stiff, but that it's low resting so that it's comfortable and that the patient can manage throughout the day. It needs to be reliably applied by myself or my colleague. It needs to stay up and provide good containment. It needs to be adaptable. So in this case, we can see that we're gonna to need to do some full leg coverage and it needs to be people friendly because if it's not comfortable, she's not gonna wear it. So what we did is you can see here where we started. This is January 17th. I've cleaned the wound. I've put a primary dressing in place in order to address the wound environment. And I've put a textured product on. And then I applied Coban 2 from the toes to the knee and then knee to thigh. 
and this is what we get. January 22nd, four days later, later, significant improvement. It's not magic, it's compression. Appropriately applied compression truly is magical. Let's look at another example. We alluded to this earlier, but I wanted to include it again because look at the, the wound that was caused behind the back of the knee with the application of those elastic wraps. Again, elastic wraps have high resting pressure and do not offer the containment to the tissue. And as a result, you can see this patient suffered a device-related injury because of the compression application. There's something better out there. And that's Coban 2, which you can apply all the way up the leg, which gives you significantly better outcomes. So it's time for a compression revolution, guys. You need to think about when you're picking compression about the working and the resting pressure, as well as the containment. You need to make sure that the products that you're picking can be reliably applied and that there's minimal slippage. You need to make sure that that product can be adapted to your patient and that it needs to be comfortable and cost effective. Compression is a powerful tool. We know that it improves circulation, arterial, venous, and lymphatic. We know that it has a positive impact on the integument health. Your wounds will heal quicker. And all of those trophic changes that you see, the lipodermatosclerotic tissue changes, the hyperkeratosis, the stasis dermatiasis, the repetitive infections, if you apply the oppression appropriately, all of that goes away. Compression truly is powerful. Compression too makes compression easy for you. I'd like to take the last little bit of your time to go over a couple of myths that are out there about compression that I get asked all the time. And the first is that a lot of people think that if a patient is non-ambulatory, that you can't use a short stretch bandage. And that's the reason I think that we see so many of these ACE bandages being applied. It's because there's a, that myth that keeps getting perseverated that if a patient is non-ambulatory, that they won't benefit from a short stretch compression application like Coban 2. And that's false. Coban 2 is a short stretch compression application. It's cohesive. It has a low resting pressure, high working pressure that is beneficial to those that are ambulatory or those that are not. The patients are gonna get the benefit of that compression application even if they don't actively move. In fact, Coban 2 with its low resting pressure is actually probably safer for those patients that are non-ambulatory. Think about your patients that don't walk. Typically they have diabetes and they don't have good sensation, so they can't feel if something is too tight. Isn't that a patient that you wanna put a wrap on that has low resting pressures? That patient that who has no sensation, you don't want a high resting pressure on that patient. They're not going to feel when that bandage is hurting them. So again, it's important that you realize that even your patients who are non-ambulatory can benefit from an application like Coban 2. The second most commonly um, myth that is perseverated out there about compression is that you can't wrap the full leg. If you're seeing patients in clinic, and you're wrapping them to the knee, you need to make sure that you're looking above where you're wrapping. If you're getting proximal fullness in the thigh, then you need to wrap the full limb. Coban 2 has the containment that allows you to wrap not only toes to knee, but knees to thigh. If you wanna improve your outcomes with those patients that have fullness in the thigh, apply Coban 2 full leg. To end it up, I'd like to share with you a few clinical pearls or application tidbits about how I use Coban 2 in my practice. I'd like to share with you some videos that we've put together of myself applying my full leg bandage. As a lymphedema therapist, I start at the toes and I go all the way to the groin. And that's what I'm going to show to you. We'll start off first with toe wraps.
Hi, my name is Susie Eman. I'm a physical therapist with a specialty in lymphedema and wound care. Today, what I'd like to show you is one application of a two-layer compressive cohesive product. Today, we're going to be using Coban two-layer. The reason we're showing Coban 2 is it's unique in that it's a product that you can not only use below the knee, but actually can be applied to the entire extremity, from the toes to the knee, and then from the knee to the thigh. We're going to start off by doing toe wraps. Um, what's really unique about doing toe wraps is we want to make sure that we protect the tissues, and in particular, the flexor tendons on the undersurface of the toe. So anytime we're doing toe wraps, we want to make sure that we provide a little bit of protection. I've actually saved some of my scraps of my comfort layer of the Coban 2, and I'm going to use that as protection up underneath your toes. So what we're going to do is we're going to layer one of each of the uh, comfort layers across the digits, and we're going to start with our toe wrap, and we're going to go around the digit, starting at the base of the nail bed, and we're going to do 50% overlap, one thing I want you to notice is that I'm not pulling tight. The radius of the toe is very small, so you don't need to apply a lot of tension in order to generate pressure. Again, we're gonna start at the base of the nail and go proximal. When you get to the bottom of the toe, you're gonna to come around the foot and begin on the second toe. So again, if you don't have a whole lot of toe swelling, you could certainly get rid of the top comfort layer and just use the one on the bottom, again, to protect that flexor tendon. I use a technique where I put one hand on top and then use my fingertip to work the product through. So again, I'm holding it, using my thumb, pushing it up and through, holding it again. I'm again holding on top so that I'm not pulling, not applying too much tension, layering 50% as you go to the base of the toe. I can't say that you would do two versus three because every toe is a different length, so but at least two turns. We're going to come around, and again, we'll keep using our protective layer underneath our digits. A couple of just kind of take-home points is um, as we're working here, again, from the tip of the toe to the base, you want to make sure that you're spreading out as you come around the foot so that we don't have multiple layers of the toe wrap right over a bony prominence. We don't wrap the pinky toe. Typically that's because the pinky toe doesn't swell. If you have someone that has toe swelling on that fifth digit, you certainly could do that. The key to toe wraps is making sure that you're not going too tight. So again, we're just gonna wrap whatever you have left. You just wanna spread that bandage out Again, so that we don't have multiple layers right at the top. So we've got nice, even distribution of the pressure for your toe wrap. The next thing I'd like to show you is how I put on a below the knee Coban 2 application. I've included some tips and thoughts as I'm performing the application. So we're gonna start off with the comfort layer, which is the first layer of the Coban 2. Um, you're gonna apply the comfort layer. I would suggest that you follow the natural contour of the foot. So again, you're not going horizontal. You're actually following the oblique angle of the forefoot. You're coming around the forefoot, wrapping around the heel. And then from here, I like to do the cut and go method. So I actually will go ahead and cut my bandage. And what, what this does is it allows me to give a better contoured fit to the patient. Maybe an extra step, but it'll pay off in the end. So we're gonna cut and stick here and kind of form that to her foot. Then we're gonna take the product and we're gonna do 50% overlap and we're gonna come around. We're gonna maintain that 50% overlap as we go up the leg. Notice that I'm not pulling, I'm simply rolling the product on. I'm gonna come up 
and I'm gonna, again at the top, follow the natural angle of the leg, and I'm gonna do an oblique angle, coming a little higher on the outside, a little lower on the inside. So you have your fibular head here, you're using it as a structure that you can um, apply compression against. You don't want it too tight on the inside by the popliteal fossa because that's where people are going to be irritated. So again, by coming at it, uh, applying the bandage with more of an angle, higher laterally, lower medially, your patient will be more comfortable. So you're going to give that a little bit of a squeeze to set the product. Notice that the bottom of the foot is not covered. We want to make sure that this is pulled down to the edge in here. And she's holding her foot at a 90 degree angle. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to take the second layer, which is the, the elastic portion of the coban. Again, we're going to start medially. We're leaving ourselves a little bit above buffer room of the, the comfort layer. We're going to go around one time. We're going to go down and catch the heel. And we're going to do a figure eight around the ankle. A little key here, when you're going across the anterior tip, you want to make sure do not pull and create tension across that anterior tip. You simply want to apply and press down and stick. Do not apply tension as you come across the front of the foot. We're going to go underneath and then back around. So again, make sure that you do not pull across that anterior tip. Simply lay the product down. Making sure that you're getting 50% overlap. And from here, all you're doing is you're rolling it on. Notice that I'm keeping the product close to the leg. Um, and, and by doing so, I can apply full stretch of the product. An error that people will do, they will roll it off and then strap. They will pull down and in, and it's going to create too much tension here. So again, you want to keep it close to the limb. Take the stretch out of the bandage, applying it at full stretch and rolling it on. Too often people, when they're doing two layer or any kind of compression, they try to engineer in the compression into the product as opposed to just allowing the product to work for them. The way a two layer works is that once you stick it together, it becomes a rigid sleeve. And then you're going to, that last little bit, you take the tension off of it and just stick. And you're going to go back and give it that coban squeeze where we set it. The product comes with a outer nylon sock. And what's great about this, it'll make it much easier for the patient to get their shoe on. And it also will help to maintain the integrity um, of the compression itself. So you put your nylon on and you can simply tuck it here at the top to keep good coverage. And that's a below the knee application. Next, we will do the above knee application. What we're doing now is we're gonna show an application of an above the knee bandage. If you have a patient and they're having thigh swelling, you need to apply compression all the way up. Um, the two layer product on the mark currently that you can do a full leg with is Coban 2. They actually make a larger thigh that helps to do a better job at covering the thigh, again, because of the larger circumference. So there's the six inch. So I've applied my below the knee bandage already. I'm simply gonna start with my six inch. I'm gonna do about a 50% overlap here where I ended up. And we're gonna come around. It's as if you were just continuing up as you go. The patient has the knee with just a little bit of knee flexion and we're going to just roll again 50% overlap as we come up with this product. Again, not applying with any tension. We're just taking the slack out of the product. 
Don't worry if you have a little bit of gapping, it's fine because what's gonna happen when we come back with that second layer, it'll stick down. So we're gonna come around and you're gonna follow the natural contour of the leg. So just as we did for below the knee, on the top, you're gonna to wanna to come at that oblique angle, following the natural um, line of the body. Sometimes I tell my patients that we're gonna follow the natural line of like a panty line. So coming down low in the groin medially, but high laterally. So again, following the seam of a panty. Don't worry about the gapping, we're gonna catch it as we come back around. So I've come up to where I want it to be. I'm just gonna come around and anchor right here. And as you get to the end of the roll, it gets a little sticky. So, so again, you're gonna stick, you're gonna take a minute to kind of set your product. So we'll come to the end of the roll. Whatever you don't need, you can trim. And if you'll take a minute and just seam your edges, that should stick for you. Okay. So that's the comfort layer. You're gonna take the cohesive layer and this product is gonna be applied just like you applied the comfort layer. So again, I'm gonna start just like I started previously. 50% overlap as we go. Notice again that I'm keeping it close to the body. Do not take the bandage way out here. If you do, you're gonna find out that it's gonna to be too much pressure, it's gonna dig, your patient's gonna complain of pain. Keep the bandage close, take the stretch out of the product as you roll. 50% overlap as you come up. And again, you're gonna follow the natural contour of the limb which means that you're gonna come a little higher up. If the bandage is really sticky, you can roll off, but again, pay attention to make sure that you're just taking the stretch out and not strapping with the bandage. If you need to change your angle, you can fold a bit and stick. Now I can go down and again, follow the natural contour of the limb and come up on the outside leaving yourself just a little bit of grace of the comfort layer on top. Again, if you've got gapping here, that's fine. You can take it and stick it because again, when it sticks, it's cohesive. You're gonna give it that little bit of a squeeze and then you can cut and trim for here. I would encourage you, um, that you wanna, just like the bottom half of the bandage we covered with a nylon, the top half of the bandage also needs to be covered with something, so you could use a, uh, any kind of elastic circular gauze. This material's sticky, so the patients, you have the potential when the patient is pulling their pants up and down that it may drag the bandage down, but if you cover it with a stockinette of some kind, um, we have even taken from the dollar store queen size pantyhose and cut off the, the panty portion and just covered the limb with that um, non-compressive nylon. It helps with pulling the pants up and down. Lastly, I know you guys know how to do it, but I'll share how I remove the bandage. Forward. So when you're removing the thigh, it's typically very easy to remove. Um, so you're simply just going to unroll it. Depending on how long the bandage has been on, um, sometimes you'll find that it actually will adhere and it'll be very difficult to remove if that's the case. Um, and you'll see that as we get to the bottom. If that's the case, you can use just use some scissors. So again, the thigh is typically very easy to get off. 
We're just unrolling. This is disposable. You cannot reuse this product. So to remove the lower leg bandage of a two-layer cohesive, in particular, Coban 2, um, I find that if the product's been on for multiple days, you'll find that as you get to the bottom of the bandage, it's significantly harder to remove it because it's actually stuck together. So I will use my safety scissors with my protective tip. I actually find it's easier to cut medially up the inside of the foot, and then you'll see as we go up. So what I'm gonna do is as I'm cutting it off, I'm pulling it away from the patient and just cutting in small portions. So I'll pull away and cut, again, to make sure that I'm not causing any trauma underneath. Cutting up the inside, and then from here, again, I'm pulling away cutting a little bit at a time. And you'll see I kind of do this zigzag. I'll do a little bit and then zigzag back this way until I'll get enough of a gap that you can get it off. And it's all about just making sure that we're not causing any additional trauma. And then we can remove it. Again, it's disposable. It's not meant for reuse. A couple of notes, just I always try to prepare the patient that they may have lines that are left on the limb, and that's fine. They'll go away um, when the, the wrap is off. There's no harm. Um, the one thing that I kind of like to notice for clinicians is notice that it's a nice even spacing. So that's letting me know that I have even um, compression all the way up the leg. Thanks again for spending some time with me today, and I hope that you learned a little bit more about compression. Compression works. Join me on the compression revolution by incorporating Coban 2 into your clinical practice for optimal outcomes.